the fifth kind. I've been a preacher for more than 30 years. I've studied and taught through the book of Genesis many, many times in churches all around the world. And I've trained pastors in the skills of interpreting texts. And it's very clear they're not stories about gods. They're stories about the powerful ones in the Bible. If you've got a being who can literally say to the ocean, thus far and no further, then our ancestors would naturally say, these are our superiors, these are our gods, and worship them. The problem is, these terraforming beings were not God. And they did things that gives this away, not least that they modified our ancestors to be a slave species for them and treated us with great disregard in a number of ways, not least that in a number of these narratives, there are genocides committed by these visitors. And so when you've got these leaders who actually have no empathy towards the human race, who have engineered as much as we would engineer Dolly the sheep, and are terraforming the planet, not just for our benefit, but for something that they are looking for, now you've got a very confused picture if you think that's God because suddenly you've got a God who can be very violent, genociding, cannot be questioned, and has no fellow feeling with the human race. If that is your image of God, and that's what you come to when you translate these other entities, the sky beings, the Elohim, as God, then the image of God you end up with is not some beautiful image of the cosmic source, a source of harmony and love and order, the source of all things, you end up with a being who is very much like an abusive and alcoholic father. And that sort of image of God has been used by religions, it has to be said, through the centuries as a way of fear-mongering and manipulating human populations. Now that is a confusion I believe we have put on ourselves through bad translations of our ancient texts. The Edo people of southern Nigeria and Benin tell a story from the dawn of time. In it, the sons of Osanabua arrive on planet Earth. They are beings who arrive from outer space to a planet that is entirely covered by water. Their task is to terraform it. After they have cleared the waters from the higher ground, their leader and father, Osanabua, appears in the sky and descends from what appears to be a chain stretching as far as the eye can see into the heavens. Osana Buwa then delegates to his sons all the subtle works of terraforming the planet ready for human society. There are a number of things that are really interesting about the Edo story of creation. And the first is that planet Earth already exists before any of the so-called work of creation. It exists but is flooded with water. And that is a detail that recurs in ancestral narratives all around the world. We then have the motif of the higher beings, the sky beings, coming down from the heavens. And a visual description of what that looked like when their leader, Osanabua, arrived on what looked like a chain stretching into the heavens. Now clearly, the tellers of this story are reaching for a metaphor at that point. They're trying to describe what they saw in the terms of the technology that they had. So what was it they were seeing? An ancient Filipino narrative of creation speaks of the arrival of Tagalog, a giant bird who hovers hawk-like over the flooded waters of the planet. Tagalog then creates vortices of wind which pull the waters away from the higher ground to create the islands. And so the work of terraforming begins. This aspect of the use of vortices of wind 
to clear land on a prehistoric planet Earth repeats in various narratives around the world, and not least of all, the Sumerian stories, those told on the ancient cuneiforms of the Mesopotamian cultures of Sumeria, Babylonia, Arcadia, and Assyria. And when we read the Sumerian account, again, we've got the descent of beings from the heavens to planet Earth, to a planet Earth that is flooded. And the first thing they have to do is the separation of the waters, separate fresh water from salt water if they're going to nurture life on Earth, and the separation of land from water. Some technology has to be used to say to the sea, thus far and no further. And once again, we've got vortices of wind doing the work, the four winds of the Sumerian account. Is the same visual memory being told from culture to culture? And if it is, who were the eyewitnesses who recalled this ancient visitation? Francisco Jimenez was the Dominican priest who in the very early 1700s translated an ancient Quiche text which had been entrusted to him. It was the Mayan creation narrative. And it spoke of the arrival of beings from the heavens to a flooded planet Earth once again, and it's flooded and shrouded in darkness. And those who arrive hover above the waters, we're told hover above the waters and hold discussions as to how they're going to nurture life on Earth, botanical life, and then zoological life, and then intelligent life with which they can work. What the text leaves open is the question of what they are hovering in. But if we're willing to read these ancient mythologies alongside each other, it's actually the Bible that introduces the theme of technology and explains what these beings arrived in when they hovered over the prehistoric waters. In the book of Genesis, we're told that the Elohim, the powerful ones, arrive over the dark flood waters of the planet in a ruach. The word ruach is popularly translated as the Spirit of God, and in later texts in the Bible, it appears to be used in that way. In its first mention in Genesis, the text specifies that the Ruach was hovering. The word for hovering, Melahefet, is the word the Bible uses to describe how birds of prey hover in the sky, appearing to float in the air without moving their wings. This is what the powerful one's Ruach was doing. It was hovering in the sky without moving any wings. The Filipino narrative speaks about Tagalog, the hawk, hovering over the waters and with its wings creating vortices of wind to clear dry land. And so there's a really interesting note here in Genesis that talks about this Ruach, which is hovering like a hawk. I wonder if there's a connection there. There is another connection in the word itself. Mauro Bellino is a scholar of ancient Hebrew. For many years, he worked for the St. Paul Press in Rome, translating with great precision the literal meaning of Hebrew words for Vatican-approved interlinear Bibles. Providing the interlinear meaning is a very exact discipline. The scholar must be rigorous in avoiding any kind of interpretation of the word and give only the literal etymological meaning of each word part. So it is with that degree of precision that Maro Benino explains in his writings that the use of the word ruach in Hebrew literature shows that the word means either a wind or something flying through the air and creating a strong wind. This meaning has survived to this day in the Ethiopian Amharic word roha. It means a fan or anything that moves through the air and creates a wind. What could this wind-making ruach possibly be? 
So just like the mysterious forces in the Sumerian narrative, just like Tagalog the hawk in the Filipino narrative, what we have here is a story of strong winds, vortices of wind being used to terraform the planet. The winds are being created by a ruach. So what is that ruach? Mauro Bellino argues that ruach is a craft. Mauro Bellino asked the question of how this word would have been written in primitive cuneiform script. Broken into two phonemes, two elements emerge. One element is that of a body of water. And the second element is of something hovering over the water. It looks like an eye from some points of view, but to the modern eye, it's very difficult not to perceive it as a flying saucer hovering over a body of water. In primitive cuneiform, a flying saucer hovering over a body of water is pronounced ruach. And the writers remember that it created a strong vortex of wind used in terraforming the planet. Now, it's fair to say that not every scholar agrees with that interpretation of ruach. But in actual fact, the word's meaning is confirmed if we go further into the Bible, into the stories of Moses and Ezekiel. Ezekiel speaks about a ruach, which picked him up and took him on journeys around ancient Iraq, flying in the sky. He describes how this ruach appeared in the sky, how it landed, what it looked like, the materials it was made of, and what kind of wheels it had. And the precision with which Ezekiel describes this craft, this ruach, is so great that NASA actually has a patent on those wheels. It was granted in 1974 to Josef Blomrich. It's called the Omnidirectional Wheel. Now, those who want to translate ruach as the spirit or spirit of God have a bit of a problem here. How can NASA have a patent on the Spirit of God? NASA has a patent on ancient technology described in great detail in the Bible. It was in 1974 that Josef Blumrich, as NASA's Chief of Advanced Structural Development, was able to obtain a patent for the omnidirectional wheel described in the Book of Ezekiel. The patent, US 378-9947A, was issued on February the 5th of 1974 and is used by NASA to this day. Sanskrit texts from the ancient Indian world of the Vedas have no embarrassment in describing the Vimanas in their ancient stories in technological terms as flying craft with capability for both aerial and space flight. A text from between 1000 of the Common Era and 1055 of the Common Era called the Samarangana Sutradhara, written by King Boja of Da, describes the capabilities and propulsion system of the Vimana. The Mahabharata speaks of Vimanas which could fly, dispatch sound-seeking missiles, and destroy targets with what we would call lasers. Once again, the ancient writers reach for metaphor to describe unfamiliar and powerful technology in earthly terms. Some Vimanas are described in terms befitting earthly palaces. Yet there's no attempt to make mechanical devices or physical technologies sound like something ethereal or spiritual. Another word the Bible uses for ancient flying technology is kavod and it means a big, heavy thing. And the way it's used in the text shows us that these big, heavy things could fly, but when they landed, they created quite a ruckus. They would arrive in fire and smoke, the earth would shake beneath them, and a sound like an enormous waterfall would emanate from the craft. And it's in one of these that the character Yahweh appears in the book of Exodus and meets with Moses on Mount Sinai. 
Now the conventional translation gets into some difficulty here because at the end of this long dialogue, Moses asks this powerful one, this Yahweh, can I see your kavod? Would you show me the kavod, the big heavy thing? Yahweh explains to Moses, you cannot see the big heavy thing move because if you do, uh, it will kill you. And the words being used are very interesting. Yahweh explains to Moses that seeing the heavy thing at close range would be fatal. Instead, Yahweh says, he will cause the goods, tub in the Hebrew, to pass by in front of Moses. The goods is another word he uses to describe his big heavy thing. Moses will then be able to watch the kabod as it moves away. However, to avoid being killed, Moses will need to be sheltered by a cleft in the rock and protected by Yahweh's hand or pan. This ever so intriguing episode has been rendered in conventional translations as Moses being allowed to see God's goodness from behind, but not face to face. But how exactly can you see goodness and see it from behind? Furthermore, since Moses has been enjoying a face-to-face -face conversation with Yahweh for some days, how can he now be told that a face-to-face -face encounter would prove fatal? Clearly, something else is intended. The explanation that Yahweh gives to Moses is that when the kavod moves, Moses cannot see it pane. And the first uses of that word pane suggest it means on the surface, or out in the open. So what Yahweh is saying is that Moses cannot be out in the open when the big heavy thing moves or the forces will kill him. That's why he has to be sheltered in a cleft in the rock. I can remember many years ago seeing the launch of the space shuttle Discovery and the forces of that launch are awe-inspiring to see. Discovery is the shuttle that relaunched the space program after the disaster of Challenger. So as we watched, we were all very conscious of the danger of the situation we were observing as these astronauts were being blasted into space by what is essentially a controlled explosion. And the forces of that explosion are so dangerous that the technicians closest to the launch in operating the launch are three miles away, sheltered behind reinforced concrete. So that gives me a framework for understanding why Moses could not be out in the open when the heavy thing moves. Now the conventional translations have it that nobody can see Yahweh face to face and live except for Moses, who can do that for several days, except for when he can't. And when he can't, then he's allowed to see God's goodness, but he can only see Yahweh's goodness from behind. Now, anyone coming across that translation knows that something is off that really is not coherent. And translators in times past really puzzled over what to do with this text because I think they did not have a technological framework to bring to this story. But now we know that a ruach is a craft with omnidirectional wheels, by the way. Now we know that a kavod is a big, heavy thing that flies. And now that we have a technological framework, we can understand this text differently. We now have language that previous generations of translators did not have. We have the language of spacecraft, we have the language of launches, we have the language of wormholes, so on and so forth. We have the language of astronauts. Now the ancients who had these experiences told us what they saw. And in between them and us are centuries of translators who had a go at this without any technological framework. Today, we're able to look at these texts and understand what we are being told. That in ancient times, our ancestors were visited by technological people from another planet 
who came and helped to rehabilitate a flooded planet Earth and terraform it for our ancestors. And not only that, had a hands-on involvement in our development as a species. I think one of the keys to this is to read the mythologies alongside each other. When you realize that the Edo narrative and the Sumerian narrative and the Filipino narrative and the Mesoamerican narrative and the biblical narrative are all relaying essentially the same story and in a way that is very, very visual. It's not reiterations of the same oral tradition. These different peoples all have a visual memory of what happened. Now, I find that very, very interesting because a visual memory, if you think about our development as a species, visual memory is going to take us much further back than any oral tradition. But what difference does it make if a flooded planet Earth was rehabilitated by visitors from outer space or by an almighty God? What are the implications for us today, one way or the other? When our ancient ancestors saw beings who had the power to create these incredible vortices of wind, who had the power to terraform, who had the power to do genetic engineering and help life on Earth back onto its feet, of course, these are godlike powers from the perspective of our ancestors. If you've got a being who can literally say to the ocean, thus far and no further, then our ancestors would naturally say, these are our superiors, these are our gods, and worship them. The problem is, these terraforming beings were not God. And they did things that gives this away, not least that they modified our ancestors to be a slave species for them and treated us with great disregard in a number of ways, not least that in a number of these narratives, there are genocides committed by these visitors who have an interest that supersedes their interest in humanity. And so when you've got these leaders who actually have no empathy towards the human race, who have engineered as much as we would engineer Dolly the sheep and are terraforming the planet, not just for our benefit, but for something that they are looking for. Now you've got a very confused picture if you think that's God, because suddenly you've got a God who can be very violent, genociding, cannot be questioned, and has no fellow feeling with the human race. If that is your image of God, and that's what you come to when you translate these other entities, the sky beings, the Elohim, as God, then the image of God you end up with is not some beautiful image of the cosmic source, a source of harmony and love and order, the source of all things, you end up with a being who is very much like an abusive and alcoholic father. And if you can imagine what happens to the psychology and well-being of a child in a home with an abusive and alcoholic father, I mean, the happiness and self-esteem of that child absolutely eviscerates. Well, that's what we do to the human race. If we put the human race in a household where the ultimate being, the God, is to be tiptoed around, cannot be offended, is incredibly violent, will kill everybody if we go too far, that's where we end up. And that sort of image of God has been used by religions, it has to be said, through the centuries, as a way of fear-mongering and manipulating human populations. Now that is a confusion I believe we have put on ourselves through bad translations of our ancient texts. So it's not just about retranslating ancient texts and finding technology in them and how fascinating that is. It's doing the translation work to separate the idea of the cosmic source from all the activities, beneficial and otherwise, of the ancient visitors who came to our planet after a cataclysm, terraformed it, and managed our ancestors. A god figure who has to be appeased and tiptoed around for fear of genocide 
is a profoundly disempowering vision for humanity. But if we can perceive ourselves as a unique race in a populated universe and finding our source in the cosmos itself and not in servitude to a superior being, does this offer a more empowering vision of humanity? For me, the reframing work that I've done in the light of my research for Escaping from Eden has reframed my whole picture of the human race, of God, the universe, and for me, it provides a far more hopeful and empowering vision of who we are and what we're capable of. It raises for me the possibility that we can live not only with better technology, but live in a more intelligent and conscious way on this planet, a way that's better for all of us. Thank you for watching The Fifth Kind. We hope you enjoyed this thought-provoking program. Check out our official website at fifthkind.tv where you can sign up to receive our latest newsletters, chat and share ideas in our online community, and select featured content that is only available on fifthkind.tv.